in a medieval world most often depicted by dark castles and darker deeds, the Bayeux Tapestry explodes onto the 11th century in impossible cartoon strip action and flamboyant colour. It's an unlikely thousand-year survivor of an ancient age from which few physical artefacts have been recovered to bear witness to the events of the time. But one historian has been ruffling academic feathers. He believes that the Bayer Tapestry holds explosive and controversial secrets the experts are ignoring. And if he's right, that's going to change everything. The thing about the tapestry is that we know it hung in by a cathedral at some stage. There's also talk about other people hanging it at the time. And the, uh, the clear indication is that the people who were at the Battle of Hastings also saw this. It was the statement of the events of the time. So why would the, we believe that the detail is so correct? Because those people saw it. So we, we're going to talk about the Bayer tapestry because it may well hold secrets that haven't been explained by historians to date. So who was responsible for commissioning the Bayeux Tapestry? The most likely contender is Odo, Bishop of Bayeux, William's half-brother who fought alongside the Conqueror and the Norman elite at Hastings. Scholars believe this because Odo is overly represented and heroically featured in a number of scenes in the tapestry, as is William himself. Perhaps Odo had the tapestry made to ingratiate himself with William since we learn from historical sources that Odo's relationship with his half-brother up to that time had been fraught and would become ever more so in the decades following the Norman takeover of England. The thing about the Bayeux Tapestry is that um, it was created in Canterbury but immediately it was made, it was shipped to Bayeux. Um, we know that it appeared in Bayeux Cathedral this event that was planned must have involved the people who were at the battlefield. There is indications in the tapestry that the elements that it shows, shows clear and concisely exactly where the battle took place. This has been ignored by historians to date. I'm going to try to unravel that for you to understand the importance of this document. The Bayer Tapestry was made to be admired, and to this date it has been viewed and wondered at by millions of people around the world. So it's reasonable to suppose that at some point in the past, our conquering heroes of Normandy would have gathered together to feast on occasion, before making their way down the tapestry's lengthy display, goblets in hand, to view and scrutinize each scene unfolding. Events in which they personally took part, with even a few marvelling at themselves in action in the expensive coloured threads and tabby weave. But here's the point. Can the Bayeux Tapestry be trusted in terms of how it's depicting events in 1066? And after many years of studying it, my answer is a resounding yes. How can we know? Because of the detail that has been put into this. 
Scenes in the tapestry are often enigmatic and baffling. We have no context for them and often struggle to identify the characters depicted. Yet there they are. And the Normans looking at them would have known what was going on in an instant. The Bayer Tapestry was more than just a, um, a cartoon. Cartoons are, um, uh, are not to be taken seriously. This had lots of really important stuff in it. It was a political statement. It had to tell everyone exactly why they were there and what they were going to, uh, to do. Um, and the whole idea that it's just a cartoon is for people who can't explain the detail. The Bayer Tapestry begins in 1064 with a meeting between King Edward of England and Harold Godwinson. Accompanying Harold is probably his brother Gerth or an advisor. We need to understand some of the backstory to 1066 in order to make sense of the details revealed in the tapestry. So let's summarise. By 1064, Harold has been Earl of Wessex for 11 years, but has effectively ruled England as sub regulus for over a decade, while King Edward retires into what amounts to a monastic life, which would later earn him the famous religious epithet, Confessor. Edward still rules, but it's Harold and the other earls, two of whom are his brothers, Gerth and Leofwine, who get the job done. Up to this point, Harold has achieved notable military successes against the Welsh. He's brought peace to the land and supervised England's transformation into one of the most wealthy and efficient nations in Europe. Trade is at an all-time high and England's military machine featuring the highly disciplined and lethal housecarls, backed up by the five hide men and civilian levies, is one of the most well-trained and feared armies across the known world. But within England's great fortune, a problem looms. Edward has been married to Harold's sister, Edith, for the 22 years since he came to the throne, and they are still childless. So England has a succession problem. The tapestry makes no mention of what this meeting and the opening scene is about, which probably takes place at Edward's palace at Winchester. It appears as though either Harold is explaining something to Edward, or the king is warning or admonishing him with wagging finger. And the only description we get, Edward Rex, King Edward. Straight after this, we are told, Here's where Harold, an Earl of the English, rides with his soldiers to Bosom. The tapestry's designer sees fit to add this detail to the story because it's from Bosom that Harold departs on a dangerous journey that will change English history forever. So let's pause and look at Bosom. 
Today it's a beautiful sleepy Sussex village situated in an inland bay which plays host to yachting fanatics and boat enthusiasts. Back in Harold's day, Bosom was his father's legendary manor and would have been the buzzing major administrative centre for Godwin rule over Wessex. The first thing Harold and his brother or companion do when they get home is to enter Bosom Church and start praying. Then it's a final meal in the upstairs dining room of Bosom Manor before Harold departs on his sea journey with his favourite hawk and a boatload of retainers. So let's hit the pause button briefly to examine some amazing tapestry detail. Here is Bosom Church today, and here is how it is depicted in the tapestry. So thin looking, more modern church with a spire, fat old Saxon church where we are looking through the west wall and up the nave towards the chancel arch. Not very similar are they? Of course, the ancient Saxon Church of Holy Trinity Bosom has had several makeovers down through the centuries. In the uncertain months of 1040, 26 years before the conquest, Chichester Harbour and in particular Bosom had become the two chief naval bases for the Saxon fleet on England's south coast. Add to that the fact that Bosom was Godwin's administrative hub for all of Wessex one can appreciate Godwin's concern that Bosom could become a prime target for attack by any enemies he has, both foreign and domestic. And the Godwins had enemies. The existing two-storey porticus erected by King Canute around 1022 is too low for the lookouts positioned at the top of the church tower, so in 1040 Godwin sets about making changes so that his lookouts have a clear line of sight of any ships approaching Bosom from the sea. Local historian John Pollock has compiled detailed research in his booklet Bosom Ecclesia demonstrating that existing archaeology gives clear indication that the footprint of the Saxon church after Godwin's modifications in 1040 looked like this with an offset wider watchtower now with three stories. This gives lookouts the clear view they need of East Head four and a half miles away on a bearing of 215 degrees true. The tapestry shows 17 joists here, which appear to be the facial decorative elements still in existence under the eaves. The faces have large eyes, indicating watchfulness. So, here is what the western end of the church's watchtower would have looked like based on remaining evidence in the stonework and foundations. And here is the Bayer Tapestry's depiction of it. Notice the attention to detail right down to the progressive narrowing of the wooden roof shingles the higher you go, a style of roofing found in other churches of the period, including survival plans of Canterbury Cathedral, dated 1160. Clearly the designer of the tapestry is an eyewitness to the Godwin's church at Bosom at the time William took it over as his personal estate after being crowned King of England.
Historians are strongly divided over the real reason Harold embarks on this precarious journey. What could possibly have motivated England's most powerful Earl to go against the King's wishes and embark upon so parlous a mission? Interestingly, the Bayer Tapestry covers Harold's disastrous trip with glee, not least because it sets up the justification for the Norman invasion, and yet it stays so silent on the real reason Harold goes. And no wonder. All sorts of reasons have been put forward to explain Harold's mysterious trip. Some scholars maintain that Harold sets sail on a simple hunting trip along the coast with his hawks and is blown off course by a storm onto the treacherous shores of Ponthieu. That's not likely. There's plenty of hunting to be had around southern England without the need to embark on a dangerous sea trip. Other scholars use all sorts of twisted logic to propose that Harold is actually being sent by Edward to confirm Duke William as Edward's chosen heir. This is even more ridiculous since it is the English Witten or governing council that appoints England's monarchs, not the king. Moreover, Edward has always harboured a long-standing grievance with Normandy over how he was treated while in the exile of his early years. Why would he have any reason now to favour the bastard son of a Norman duke whom he hardly knew? William had no claim to the English crown then, and he certainly has no claim now or Edward would certainly have endorsed it. Think about this. If Edward wanted William to succeed him so badly, why did he not have the Duke publicly declared his chosen heir before witnesses on any number of occasions? He never did. In fact, as recently as 1057, Edward has invited the last heir to the Saxon throne, the child Edgar, to return to England with his parents from their exile in Hungary to be trained for kingship. But the boy is barely into his teens and obviously no match for the violent political machinations of 11th century England, and time is running out for Edward. There is a pressing reason Harold has to go. A childless king of a wealthy kingdom has the sharks circling, and it's becoming clear to the Witten that upon Edward's death, Norway, Denmark and Normandy may all press violent claims to England's throne. With his proven military and political acumen, Harold is the seasoned obvious choice to succeed a childless Edward and protect the country. No one in England doubts it. The problem is, Harold has a younger brother, Wulfnoth, and a nephew, Hakon, who were abducted as hostages by the Norman Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert of Jumierge, who fled England with them 12 years before in 1052, after losing a showdown with the Godwins. But these two Godwin lads were never returned. They were handed over to William of Normandy by the scheming Archbishop. Harold now needs to get these boys clear of William before he can launch his own bid to take the crown of England and stand up to any foreign invasion that might come because of it. The boat trip is high risk strategy. It's dawned on Harold that there is no other choice except to leave his brother and nephew to their fate in a foreign land across the sea. Harold's request to Normandy for return of Wolf, Noth and Hakon after so long can only be seen by the Duke as proof Harold is positioning himself for a shot at the English crown. Is this what we are witnessing in the opening scene of the Bayer Tapestry? Harold explaining the boy's predicament to Edward and the king admonishing Harold that his proposed journey is such folly, it can only end in tears and complete disaster for the kingdom. No wonder Harold falls on his knees and prays fervently in Bosom Ecclesia prior to his departure. We will examine later the stunning proof that Wolfnoth and Hakon are almost certainly the real reason Harold takes his nightmare trip to Normandy. What the sources all seem to agree upon for now is that Harold's ship does end up in a storm off the Normandy coast, and Harold and his companions run that battered boat aground on the dark and treacherous beach of Count Guy of Ponthieu.
Ponthieu is not Normandy. It's a semi-independent enclave to the northeast, owing allegiance to its more powerful Norman neighbor. But the Count and the rest of Ponthieu are notorious for the practice of shipwrecking, putting false lights out on the cliffs to lure ships and their hapless occupants onto the rocks where the vessels are plundered for their goods and riches and the victims are heftily ransomed. Or if no one pays up, murdered. Looks like he actually has a knife drawn when he's overpowered by Count Guy and his men. Here he is being escorted to Guy's residence at Beaurain. Notice that both of them are carrying their hawks and riding with the dogs they brought with them. The scene looks stiff but cordial, obviously not depicting a situation where Harold and his men are seized, clapped in irons and tossed into a dungeon as the sources Jumierge and Poitiers recount. Here the tapestry shows Guy interviewing Harold and his companion, while Harold's men wait outside under the watchful eye of their backshaven guard. Notice, notice how the tapestry starts to make a distinction from this point forward between the Anglo-Saxon English with their long hair and flowing moustaches, and the Normans here with their tough nut, razor-backed skinhead haircut. Here, Guy is seated with his sword of state in evidence, indicating his authority. He's the tough guy in this scene, but he's not the toughest in the region by a long shot. One of Harold's party has escaped and made their way to Rouen to explain to William about his English lord's most parlous predicament. You see, Guy hasn't exactly hastened to notify William that he has in his possession a pearl of great price. So here in the tapestry you see an official to the right of Guy pointing out William's messengers approaching to command Guy to surrender Harold to the Duke as you might imagine, this does not go down well with Guy, who stands outside to greet William's emissaries with a huge axe and a face that could scare cattle. The politics are interesting. Guy's brother, Anne Guerin, was William's brother-in-law until 11 years before when he was killed in battle in a failed invasion attempt of Normandy. So there is no love loss between Guy and the Duke. Guy spent two years at the business end of a Bayeux dungeon 10 years before for joining the King of France in another failed invasion attempt of Normandy. So Guy is not anxious to repeat that experience. He's gonna do what he's told, but don't expect him to like it. Count Guy of Pontieu is under threat of military action if he does not comply. So Guy heads out to the Norman border town of Eu to hand Harold over to the Duke. With them go their hawks to show William they come in peace, and in return for Guy's obedience, the Count receives from William a hefty chunk of cash in payment of Harold's ransom. He's even granted an estate by the Duke on the River Ong. It's a historic moment when William and Harold finally come face to face with each other for the first time. Probably neither man realizes at this point how their relationship will change the medieval world forever. Guy is dismissed with his loot 
and William and his comitatus waste little time escorting Harold back to Rouen. William has even bought his hawk. It's all hail fellow well met. For the seasoned Harold is gazing around him, evaluating his position, which does not look promising. Now firmly caught in the Duke of Normandy's web, and with England's very survival and his brother and nephew to play for, Harold knows the stakes could not be higher as this Game of Thrones commences. tapestry shows Harold in a meekly submissive pose before the enthroned majesty of the Duke. But this is clunking post-invasion Norman propaganda. The reality is, William and Harold are two of Europe's towering personalities with international reputations for uncompromising deeds of daring and military valour. They get along fine, albeit each sizing up the other warily, searching for ways to find common ground and competitive advantage. William plays the genial host, and Harold is spoilt rotten at Rouen Palace. He's introduced to William's family, including the Duke's wife, the diminutive Duchess Matilda of Flanders. Harold has a reputation as a ladies' man, and there are stories of William retiring early to bed, leaving Matilda to work her persuasive charms on Harold with endless conversation into the night to win the Earl over to be William's man in England. William knows that while Harold might view him as a threat, little Matilda is sure to slip safely under Harold's guard so all can be accomplished. Examining the sources, Matilda and Harold have the love of their children in common. Both have happy relationships with their spouses, rare for aristocrats in the 11th century. William and Matilda already have three sons and three daughters, and Harold and Edith of Nazing have three sons and two daughters. Matilda comes down to us as an ideal of medieval maternal love, and is venerated to this day by her countrymen. But there is more to this story than meets the eye. William has been conditioned by all the violence and death threats he suffered during his chaotic childhood and has grown up harsh and cruel. He has an uncompromising determination to exercise absolute control over his environment and those within it. He sees himself always as the devout Christian under siege, the injured party, the wronged man. So whatever course he pursues, and however many may be injured or killed in the doing of it, all is justified because a wrong is being set right by William before God. So, what kind of man is this Duke of Normandy Harold is facing now? Harold's in his early 40s and William is six years younger. They are both of similar height and build, five foot ten. Both are descended from a long line of Scandinavian warlords. William is thick set and muscular and speaks with a rough, guttural voice. He is virtually illiterate but was well trained by his tutors in all aspects of castle building and war. In fact, William and war 
were made for each other. To observers who know him personally, William comes across as uptight, imperious and intimidating. The word has done the rounds that the Duke never kills a man if he can use him. William is an elaborate mix of calculated cruelty, rapacious greed and unexpected largesse and forgiveness. Rather than execute or poison them, he prefers to marry defeated rivals off to his relatives, so William's interests now become theirs. In the years since their marriage, Matilda has become well schooled in her husband's favourite tactic of the irresistible offer to bring enemies into the fold. In this way, William simultaneously eliminates opposition from rivals while forming an ever-growing, fanatically loyal band of knights around him. And here's the important part. The continued good fortune of these barons depends on their willingness to help William win and forge an ever-expanding empire with which to enrich them. Which is why by 1064, now that William has long since secured Normandy and the surrounding regions with his monopoly on state-sanctioned violence, he started to share his future plans about England with his inner circle over supper. Ambitions which scare the living daylights out of even the bravest and those most loyal to him. The next scene in the tapestry is this one. No one is certain who this woman is or why she is the most prominently displayed of the only three women stitched into the tapestry. At least a dozen candidates have been put forward as elf giver by scholars over the centuries, accompanied by fanciful and often serpentine theories for why she is depicted here. Let's get our research hats on and start with what we do know. One, this licentious scene is clearly important to the story the tapestry is telling us, or it would not have been included. Two, as one of only three women depicted in the entire tapestry, Elfgiva appears to play a prominent role in why Harold is in Normandy, otherwise she is superfluous to the story. The tapestry's job is morally to justify William's invasion and takeover of England, and the details need to be accurate enough to satisfy those scrutinizing it, who would have taken part in William's great English adventure. The scene is clearly depicting something sexual and scandalous in nature, which is apparently so well known that just a hint of it is enough for the contemporaneous Norman viewers of the tapestry to recognize who this woman is and why she's here. This scene and the one preceding it appear to be linked by Harold speaking with William while pointing to the woman. The Latin inscriptions of the two panels joined together read, Here Duke William came with Harold to his palace, where Elf Giva and a certain priest. The conjunction ubi means where, and crops up five times in the tapestry as a device used to link scenes together. So the woman we are looking at is physically at William's palace at Rouen and is almost certainly English. It doesn't help that Elf Giva, which means Elf Gift, was an extremely common name in pre-conquest Anglo-Saxon England.
five. There is no evidence that the tapestry indulges in any flashback scenes featuring people long dead or physically absent as some maintain. This is important because it discounts almost all candidates put forward for Elf Giva in flashback theories proposed by experts. So we're left with two candidates who potentially can be physically present at the time Harold is brought in by William to Rouen. The first is Harold's sister Elf Giva. A common theory is that Harold brought his sister with him on the trip, either to offer her in marriage to one of William's nobles, which makes no sense under the circumstances, or even to use her as a hostage to secure the release of his brother Wolfnoth and nephew Hakon, which is also illogical. Moreover, no sources indicate that Harold's sister ever goes with Harold to Normandy, or even that she was already there when Harold arrived which leaves only one other candidate, also named Elf Giva. She is English, has a pressing relevance to the conquest story, has links with the church, has been largely overlooked by experts, and this Elf Giva has almost certainly been in Normandy for the past 12 years. But to explain who she is and why she's there, we must take a trip back 18 years to a troubled land of dark forests and towering ramparts. Swain Godwinson, the King's Earl of the Western Marches, is returning from a successful campaign against the Welsh. As Harold's brother crosses the border back into England, he is captivated by the beauty of the Abbess of Lempster, so he kidnaps her and holds her at his pleasure for 12 months. Carnal flings don't last 12 months. It takes a full year to dislodge the abbess from Swain's amorous clutches, which seems to indicate that the two are in love, that the abbess no longer wishes to be an abbess. Scandal rocks England, and the king reacts fiercely. He refuses Swain's repeated requests for permission to marry her. No one cares whether this is lust or love. She's an abbess for pity's sake. The Godwins have an uneasy relationship with Edward at best. They don't need this scandal now. Violent, belligerent, untamable, Swain won't see reason and refuses to return the girl to the nunnery. Edward is pressured to act both by church leaders and the king's favoured Norman party led by Robert Champart, Bishop of London. The king makes the proclamation that Swain has forthwith lost his earldom. Wild, unpredictable and friendless, Godwin's heir is compelled to leave the country. We are told the abbess returned to her abbey. Maybe she did for a while, until the heat died down. As for Swain, the ogre found love. But in the end, they even took that away from him. There is no surviving information on the abbess's family, who her parents were, or how they were politically connected. But here's what we do know about her. We have a name, which in Anglo-Saxon is Aid Gifu, and in Latin, Elf Giva. We also know from the sources that Swain Gobinson has an illegitimate son named Hakon from some amorous conquest, who later ends up in Normandy as a hostage in Duke William's court. Now, while Hakon's mother is not identified in the sources as such, it seems reasonable to suggest that Elf Giva would be a leading contender, since the abbess and Swain cohabit for 12 months, during which time scholars are fairly certain they weren't playing I Spy or pin the tail on the donkey. 
Some scholars maintained that a disgraced, fornicating abbess with a baby would never be restored to her former ecclesiastical authority, much less if the baby were Swain's heir. So Godwin would have brought the abbess and her child into the family and probably moved them to his headquarters at Bosom for safekeeping, while working out what to do about getting Swain back. But how does an abbess in 1046 end up in Rouen, Normandy in 1064, having her face stroked by a lascivious priest in the Bayeux Tapestry? Five years after Swain's banishment, King Edward engineers a major showdown with the Godwins in 1051, during which he attempts finally to rid himself of this overmighty Wessex family for good. Things rapidly get ugly, and two Godwin children, Wolfnoth and Hakon, are submitted as hostages by Godwin to the king to ensure safe conduct. Since Hakon is believed to be only five at this point, his mother will reasonably have accompanied the little boys into the king's custody. In any event, the other earls declare for the king, and Harold and his family are compelled into a hasty exile, fleeing the kingdom for their lives, leaving the two children behind them. Edward is ecstatic at his new one freedom. He awards the Godwin earldoms to his most faithful supporters and even banishes his long-suffering queen, Harold's sister Edith, to the nunnery at Werewell. But the royal gloating is unseemly and short-lived. The following year, the Godwins are back, having raised overwhelming political and military support, with even the remaining English earls and most of England's public now siding with them. Facing disaster, Edward angrily capitulates and is forced to restore to Harold's family their earldoms, lands, wealth and titles and recall his queen from the harsh servitude at the Werewolf nunnery. The king's vengeful Norman Archbishop of Canterbury, however, is a different matter entirely. Robert Champart de Jumierge, longtime companion to King Edward and a confirmed Godwin hater, has been one of the architects of this national crisis. When Robert realizes that London is showing alarming signs of declaring for the Godwins, and that the two other earls that matter, Leofric and Seward, won't back the king this time, Robert and his Norman faction realize they're in trouble. Forestalling Godwin vengeance, the Archbishop flees the country for Normandy, taking with him the Godwin hostages Wolfnoth and Hakon, which some scholars reason will also have included Hakon's mother, Elf Giva, to care for them. Swain and his affair with the Abbess are all but written off by historians as a colourful footnote to the closing years of Anglo-Saxon England. Yet Swain's actions and eventual fate shape events which directly lead to the Norman invasion of England.
it takes months for news of Swain's death to reach England via a returning comrade. When Godwin is told in early 1053, the news is a crushing blow from which some say he never recovers. A few months later, at the Easter Royal Court at Winchester, the Earl suffers a stroke and is carried from the hall by Harold and his young brothers Tostig and Gerth. Foul play is not suspected by the sons, who are all too aware of the burden of grief Godwin has borne for Swain, as well as his own missing son Wolfnot and grandson Hakon. The veteran politician, who has been Earl of Wessex under four kings throughout one of England's most turbulent times, dies in the royal bedchamber three days later, without having recovered his senses. He is laid to rest by his grieving widow and family, alongside his old friend Canute and nephew Bjorn in Winchester's Old Minster. That Godwin was viewed by many as England's protector and the kingdom's father is underscored by the lavish ceremony more befitting a passing king. Perhaps he was. Godwin's death marks a watershed moment for Edward, making it possible for the king finally to close a painful chapter in his own life and move on. In an age where life is often brutal and short, this is nonetheless a religious society in which the gift of your life is lived under heaven's eye, and you stand before God in the final judgment to give an account. Respike fine, know your final outcome. 11th century life is about repentance, and Edward knows in his heart that he has not repented of his own fury and sin. In hating the Godwins, have I hated God? Has it been God's will all along that the Godwins had destiny in helping me rule England, but I rejected them? And in rejecting my own wife, have I fought God's hand in the matter? Have I failed to produce England's heir from the loins of my godly wife just to spite the godwits? What have I done? Even Sway, steeped in his own sin, repented. And I have not. After Godwin's funeral, Edward approves Harold's appointment as Earl of Wessex to replace his father. Now Harold becomes the second most powerful man in England next to the king. One source records that Harold is the wisest of all the brothers, at whose appointment the nation rejoices. England yearns for peace, and things soon settle down. As the months pass, the king increasingly leaves most of the kingdom's daily business to his earls and moves thereafter into a life of deep repentance and spiritual introspection. Edward's great work during the final 12 years of his life is the magnificent construction of the original Westminster Abbey out of the dilapidated old mission church of St. Peter on Thorny Island. Edward is now fixing his eyes on the things above and not on the things of this earth.
pick up any standard English history book on the Norman period, and the chances are you'll be told that Duke William came over to England in 1051 to visit his old friend King Edward, during which time Edward made his famous pledge to William that the crown was his after Edward was finished with it. This is then cited as ample justification for William's anger and subsequent invasion when Harold takes the crown in 1066. Except that the story of William's 1051 visit to England is utter nonsense. Complete piffle. Medieval fake news. More of that amateur anachronistic post-invasion Norman propaganda in an attempt to legitimise William's illegal coup d'etat of the English state. There are lazy scholars who perpetuate the myth to this day by dismissing with a wave of the hand the following established facts. No English sources record any visit to England by William, Duke of Normandy, at any time before he crashes ashore with his invasion force in late September 1066. At the time that Edward is having his major meltdown with the Godwins in 1051, William is engaged in his own vicious fight for survival across the Channel in Normandy. He's fighting tooth and nail to defend his duchy against Henry, King of France, and a coalition of murderous barons. So ask yourself this, how likely is it that William is going to break off hostilities at such a critical moment just to scoot across the Channel to confirm his spurious claim to England's throne? He's not even in complete control of Normandy in 1051. England's ruling High Council, the Witten, has the final say in the appointment of England's kings, not the monarch. And the Witten approved no such arrangement with William in 1051, or it most certainly would have been recorded. On the contrary, the Witten unanimously voted to give the crown to Harold Godwinson in January 1066, and that is recorded. William's claim to the throne, by dint of his proximity of kinship to Edward, is also a joke. He's a second cousin of Edward's once removed. One of the Norman sources, William of Poitiers, which promotes William's 1051 fantasy English visit, even dares to state that England's three major earls at that time, Godwin, Leofric and Seward, all swear oaths to accept William as king upon Edward's death this is nonsense. Another fairy tale is that Edward so loves William as a son and a brother that he pledges the throne when William visits England in 1051. The reality? Edward never knew William as an adult. The last time Edward saw William was when the young Duke was a frightened 13-year-old wondering when the next assassin was going to smash down his bedroom door. Yet more Norman fiction is that Edward has such fond memories of Normandy as his childhood exile sanctuary and owes such a debt of gratitude for the wonderful treatment he received from his genial Norman hosts in Rouen that he pledges William as his successor during the Duke's supposed English visit in 1051. The reality is that Edward harbored a smoldering anger for the rest of his life over how the Normans treated him during his early exile years. He loathed his mother, Emma of Normandy, because she abandoned him and his brother Alfred abroad while returning to Winchester to marry England's new invader king, the Danish terrorist Canute. And finally, if Edward wanted William to succeed him so much, why did Edward go to all the trouble of inviting Edgar the Etheling and his father back from Hungary as his successors in 1056, five years after he supposedly pledged the throne to William? There is a simple explanation for all of this, which more than a few scholars endorse. Edward doesn't promise England's throne to William. Robert de Jumiers does, speaking deceitfully in the king's name. We know for a fact that at some point, Robert shows up at Rouen Palace one day with the two Godwin lads, seeking an audience with William, fresh from his flight from England. How do you think that conversation went? After all, Godwin is England's leading earl, and here are his kin before William, apparently as collateral for the offer. What's more, Robert is Archbishop of Canterbury, the highest ecclesiastical station in the kingdom, 
Canterbury's Archbishop crowns kings, is a post to which Robert was appointed the year before by none other than Edward, King of England himself. This promotion was later officially confirmed by Pope Leo IX when Robert traveled to the Vatican for his pallium. So far as William's concerned, Robert's as official as it gets in the religious world by the time he shows up at Rouen. The Archbishop of Canterbury's word is not only God's word, it's also King Edward's. How do I think the conversation went? I think William smells a rat, especially when he finds out that Robert has just been outlawed by the English for making trouble with the Godwins. But the Duke has nothing to lose by going along with Robert's story for now. After all, he's got two valuable English hostages, which could be useful in the future. Besides, William now has another opportunity to play the Christian, writing a moral wrong before God by tending to poor Robert in his exile. In fact, and this one takes the biscuit, William will later cite Robert's treatment by the English as one more of his moral justifications for the invasion of England. Of course, Normans wrote the official history after 1066, but it's clear that William believed some sort of legitimate offer was made at some point. And if Robert was the one who deceitfully made it, and he died soon after at Jimmy Edge, this explains why Edward would not have known of this perfidious development, and why he sent a hungry for Edgar and his father four years later to offer them the succession. So what became of Robert de Jumierge? Bitter against the English, who rejected and outlawed him for his scheming and treason, Robert hands the boys over to William for safekeeping, knowing the Godwins can't get them now. It's a revenge of sorts for Robert, but he doesn't have long to savour it. Records show that he dies without suspicion soon after at his old abbey at Jumierge, from which he'd once departed for his own grand English adventure. But his malicious act lives on to sentence two innocent young boys and one weary elf giver to a long foreign captivity. It also forces Harold to embark on his dangerous visit to Normandy 12 years later in a rescue mission that will change English history forever. <laughs>